Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West, medical oncologist in Seattle, Washington. ASCO 2018 shaped up to uh, be a showdown between two trials of chemo combined with immunotherapy as first-line treatment for advanced squamous non-small cell lung cancer. I highlighted one of these in a very recent prior video on Keynote uh, 407, which looked at carboplatin and ataxane, either standard solvent-based paclitaxel or NAB paclitaxel alone versus combination with pembrolizumab. And this was a highly positive trial that I believe should become a new standard of care for most patients with advanced squamous non-small cell lung cancer, probably accepting those with the highest level of pdl one expression. Uh, but Another trial uh, was uh, also presented at ASCO in the same setting, and this was the Empower 131 study. I've got the design uh, for you to see here. This was presented by Dr. Bob Jotty at the meeting, and it was over a thousand patients with advanced squamous non-small cell lung cancer not previously treated, um, and it was any degree of pdl one expression, and patients were randomized to one of three arms. The control arm is shown in red at the bottom, and this is carbo and nab paclitaxel as a doublet compared to uh, the primary control arm B, which was in the middle in blue, and that is the same chemo of carbo and nab paclitaxel, also known as abraxane, with atezolizumab. Uh, and the third arm is at the top arm A, which is carbo and standard dose uh, or standard solvent-based paclitaxel, also with uh, atezolizumab. And the trial was designed to focus on arm A only conditionally if arm B was superior to arm C. There were co-primary endpoints of progression-free and overall survival. The study demonstrated a significant benefit in progression-free survival uh, for arm B, the triplet with carbonab, paclitaxel, atezolizumab over chemotherapy alone. And uh, you can see the differences. They, uh, the hazard ratio is 0.71, not a big difference in median uh, progression-free survival, but the curves separate and maintain that separation uh, over time so that by a year out, the difference in PFS is 12%. Uh, in the control arm, and it's more than double that at 24.7% uh, in the triplet uh, arm. So when you look at the clinical subgroups, you can uh, see that the trends hold up favoring the triplet combination uh, in essentially all of these different variables. And uh, they're the main focus, I would say, that uh, the, one of our biggest interests is on whether these differences are, are seen throughout the different uh, spectrum th from low PDL1 or negative PDL1 to high. And as shown in uh, this figure, you can see that in arm B versus arm C, there were most pronounced differences in PFS favoring the triplet in the patients with the highest PDL1, but the benefit was also seen to a lesser degree in patients with lower or even negative PDL1 that the curves uh, on the, the lower uh, right. So turning to response rate and duration of response, I would say you see the same theme here that the best results are seen in the patients with high PDL1, where the triplet was associated with a very impressive 60% response rate, uh, remarkably greater than the doublet. In contrast, in the, the low PDL1 or the negatives, just a, a modest trend toward a higher response rate, but overall better for uh, the, the broad population and uh, no group in whom it, it looks worse. And uh, when you look at the bottom, bottom of uh, the figure, you can see that uh, the, the duration of responses was higher in the patients who received the triplet across all of these subgroups. Now, when we look at overall survival, it's a different picture. Uh, there's a separation of the curves late toward the right side, um, and uh, it may turn out that these differences become more pronounced with longer follow-up, but Overall, I would call this pretty disappointing with a hazard ratio of 0.96 and no difference, no hint of a real difference in median overall survival. When we look at the different PDL1 subgroups, it helps to explain this, uh, this finding, uh, which 
What we see is in the high PDL1 group a marked benefit in favor of the triplet. We see not much of a difference, but a trend in the right direction for the PDL1 negative group on the right side. But in the middle, we see curves that just don't make much sense. And the curve that's on top is the chemotherapy alone uh, and a net unfavorable uh, hazard ratio in this middle group for PDL1 low. And when you put all of these together, you end up with that curve that we saw for the aggregate overall survival without a benefit. And uh, it's hard to explain this. I think it, it really must come down more to the vagaries of subgroups than anything else, because I would say it's biologically not plausible that you would have a harmful effect for the low PDL1 group, uh, but uh, a more favorable uh, appearance in the, the PDL1 negatives. So where, where should we take this? Uh, I would say that it's certainly encouraging and you could consider the combination of carbo and nab paclitaxel with the tezolizumab as another option, but I don't see why I would want to do that compared to a carbo and uh, either standard paclitaxel or nab paclitaxel Keytruda or uh, pembrolizumab combination uh, that was studied in uh, Keynote 407, uh, which was positive not just for progression-free survival, but also for overall survival, and that was in all of the subgroups. So I don't see any reason why one would favor or really consider this regimen with the tezolizumab. It's not clear that there's real substantial differences between the checkpoint inhibitors, but uh, the fact that you have one trial that was positive in all of these subgroups and overall survival was significantly better, and another trial with a different checkpoint inhibitor in which you didn't see that overall survival benefit, I think we should be cautious about just presuming that these checkpoint inhibitors should be considered interchangeable. Uh, we, we still need to learn a lot more, and for now I would say that the uh, Keynote 407, uh, Pembrolizumab, and Chemo combination is going to be my favorite approach for patients with advanced squamous non-small cell lung cancer. I welcome your thoughts and questions and comments, so please leave them, and I hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. I'll have more to talk about in subsequent videos. Take care.